We can build a society. We can do better and be better than this. We can build a society that helps us all. We can build a society that every child that sits in a classroom outside of these doors feels a sense of pride and opportunity and knows that they can be that astronaut or they can be that academic genius or they can be that important entrepreneur or engineer, a member of Congress, a president of the United States or teacher, they can be that person of humanity and caring. As African Americans, we take a great pride in moral leadership and we need to do it at this critical point and each and every one of you are a vital part and pivotal role in the leadership. The moral compass stops with you. We must be the justice carriers wherever we are. During the Civil Rights Movement, for example, we had a peaceful movement that forced the nation to begin to look at itself. Now, not only must we push back against assault on our rights, and frankly, that happens almost daily, but we must be activists. And activism, as I said in a session yesterday called Power Now, I heard millennials talk about social media. And I'm not here to, in any way, cast any challenge to that. I think it's powerful and important and a new part of the social justice movement. But as you do that, be an activist. Move from that social media uh, arena. Go out to a classroom because you are a role model for that first grader and fifth grader, middle schooler and high school. Let's carry them with us. Let's carry them on the march for freedom. I'm pleased and delighted that we have such wonderful panelists this morning that will capture the very essence of what I have said to you this morning. It's good to have corporate America that has a social agenda that understands the empowerment of all people. And so it is my privilege to thank Procter & Gamble for its generous support and for its commitment to diversity, inclusion, and positive community impact. Would you give Procter & Gamble a very big hand? And I always want to thank our media sponsor, totally <coughs> by African Americans, that you all the time. Uh, we, we do not, we know where we came from. Uh, we know we stand on the backs of shoulder, the shoulders of giants. Uh, when I was uh, a mayor of the city of Newark, my mom uh, and Fisk University invited me down to be a commencement speaker, and I was really proud of that moment, uh, uh, feeling great. But I remember sitting down at the head table, and my mother comes over and starts to shove me. She says, get up from that seat, boy. And you never, you know you're never old, so old that your mom can't tell you to talk to you that way. And she starts pulling me out of my seat, and I'm like, mom, mom, I'm the mayor. <laughs> but then she starts bringing me from table to table and says, you need to meet this person. Uh, she led our voter registration drives when we were there. We need to meet this person. She led our sit-in movements. It was almost like she was saying, pay attention, boy. There are so many strong women who have been fighting in the fields, in the vineyards, in the streets, in the communities for so many decades. You need to understand upon whose shoulders you stand. And, as Senator Harris and I know, the work that is still yet to be done. We still live in a nation where black women make 63 cents for what a white man does. We still live in a nation uh, where the black maternal mortality rate is almost twice what it is uh, for white women. We still live in a nation uh, where we are, as a community, uh, as African Americans in general, are facing wealth disparities that are as great as they've never been greater since 19, 1970. And so understanding that work that we still have to do, Senator Harris and I are committed to the fight. But more importantly, we know we do not stand alone. And on that point, uh, many of us have been in situations where we're the only one like us in a room. And that could be a boardroom, it could be a courtroom, it could be just in a, any kind of meeting. And one of the things that I really want to urge everyone to take away from this week in this conference is to one, look around and always remember there are a lot of us. And we are with you in those rooms when it may appear that you're the only one like you there. And so part of the takeaway from this week is to remember that when we're in those rooms, we're representing so many voices who support us sitting in those rooms and speaking up and speaking truth. And on the point of speaking truth, this is an inflection moment in the history of our country. We are facing challenges like we have not in a long time. It reminds me of the moment in time when my parents met when they were active in the 60s in the Civil Rights Movement. And it's a moment in time where there are a lot of people feeling, understandably, a great deal of distrust. Distrust in their government, 
and its institutions and its leaders. And so this is a moment where we have to deal with that distrust. We understand it, we know it, and we have to build on the trust that needs to be built to make this a better country. And part of that means dealing with the fact that in any relationship of trust, it's a reciprocal relationship. You give and you receive trust. And one of the most important ingredients in a relationship of trust is truth. But it's a funny thing about truth. Speaking truth can often make people quite uncomfortable. Speaking the truths that Senator Booker just spoke about the disparities as it relates to black women in America can often make people quite uncomfortable. But the other thing about speaking truth is this. Yes, people may walk away from the conversation thinking, you know, I don't particularly like what I had to hear. But they'll also walk away from that conversation respecting that it was an honest conversation. And so part of the takeaway from this week is let us continue speaking our truth, no matter how uncomfortable it makes people feel. Because without speaking those truths, we will not get to a point of all people trusting in who we are as a country and knowing that they are being seen and being heard. So I, I'm just so pleased about everything that we're doing together, Corey. Amen. Amen. So One's name was Shipra and the other's name was Pura. I wanted to name my two daughters that, but my wife stopped me on that one. <laughs> and Shipra and Pura were Hebrew midwives. And it was their job to help the Hebrew women at the birthing stool to give birth to children. But they had received orders that they were to kill the Hebrew baby boys, turn them over to the soldiers as soon as they were born. Yes, basically, that was a way of, let's end early childhood education. Y'all women out, let's end feeding programs to make sure children have health and nutrition. Uh, let's desiccate our public schools and ignore them. That, that, I'm just, not, this is the Bible. This is what I'm saying in the scriptures. And then the Bible says, and I quote, in spite of the orders of Pharaoh, the Hebrew midwives, Shepra and Pura, feared God. And they did not obey the orders of the Pharaoh and they let the Hebrew children live. In fact, the Bible says they actually lied. They actually lied and God blessed their life because what happened was they were ordered to, and I'm gonna stop in a minute, but they were ordered, as soon as the women give birth, you take the baby from the women, don't give it to the mom, take the baby, give the baby to the soldiers, and then the soldiers would kill them. Well, these two midwives did a Harriet Tubb. <laughs> They said, we don't know what happened. The baby escaped. <laughs> <laughs> the baby. They just flat out lied. They, 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 the soldier said, well, 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 where's the baby? They said, you know something? You know, Pharaoh, we just don't know what to do. These Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. The Egyptian women are polite and nice. These Hebrew women are hollering and screaming and tearing on. And before we get there, they done pop the baby out and the baby's gone. <laughs> and the Bible says God blessed them. Philosopher Soren Kierkegaard called this the teleological suspension of the ethical. And, and so what they did was they realized that there was a law higher than man's law, the law of God, the God who decrees freedom for all of God's children, the God who believes in love as the way of life, the God who has decreed human equality from the very beginning. And they believed in this God, and they knew that this God would deliver them. And these women kept saving these Hebrew children until one of these children was named Moses, and that baby saved them. The child you save today may save you tomorrow. And I say all of that to say that there will always arise pharaohs who know not Joseph. The people of God know that behind the veil of history, behind the ambiguities of life and existence, standeth God within the shadow. The God who is the author of love. The God who is the author of justice. The God who is the source of compassion. 
and the God who can lead us and show us on our way. If you don't believe me, and I'm going to sit down now because these are just welcoming remarks, you might believe the animal planet. I uh, watch the animal planet regularly. Um, it, it just helps me to kind of focus. Because if you watch animals, you learn a lot about people. Anyway, this one particular show had was a show about um, this, fan, this mother bear, and she had uh, you know, her baby bears, her cubs. And she was raising her baby bears as, as we must raise our children and young people <coughs> so that they become bears in the best sense of the word. And we must raise human beings, human adults of dignity and honor and worth. And she was doing what a mother bear does. Well, one of the little cubs, you know, decided he was going to go play on his own. And he left his mom and his brothers and sisters. I don't know where the daddy bear was, but I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> Anyway, he left his mama and, and, and his brothers and sisters and went off to play by himself. Well, the camera was following this baby bear, this cub, and, and he went off by himself and he was just having a good time. And he was out in the woods and he realized he was by himself, but he just kept playing until he turned and looked and he saw this wolf. And he kind of was a little concerned because that wolf was licking his lips. And, and the little cub kind of backed up a little bit. And the wolf took his position, because I think the wolf knew this was dinner time. And so the wolf started moving toward the baby bear. And the little cub backed up, because he knew he was in trouble. And the wolf came forward again. And, and the cub backed up. Wolf took a step forward again. The little cub backed up. And he hit a tree. And he knew he was in trouble. And then, and literally, this really was on the camera. And I'm a preacher, so I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not that much. <laughs> but you could see the little cub's mind, and you could see he was like trying to figure out what do I do now? I'm backed up on this tree, I'm stuck here, and this wolf is coming after me. And, and he did what y'all know what, what, what we mean when we say, What would Jesus do? <laughs> little, little cub kind of thought his equivalent of what would Jesus do? What would mama do? And he remembered what mama would do in a situation like this. And the little cub got up on his hind legs, on his haunches, and raised his little paw like a preacher, raised the little paw, and he went, Bam! <laughs> And the wolf, this is true, I mean, I really just said, it was like the wolf started smiling and said, this is so cute. <laughs> and the little cub went after him again and went, Bam! And, 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 and the wolf was still smiling. And the little cub was kept trying to do whatever he could, <laughs> And the wolf said, I had enough of this. And the wolf was about to come forward, and all of a sudden, the wolf stopped in his place, had a look of terror on his face, and ran. The little cub. <laughs> See, you know, young people, y'all too young to remember George Jefferson. But George Jefferson used to pat himself on the back, and the little cub was patting himself on the back, feeling all good, saying, I did that. And then the little cub turned around. And look, because behind the tree was Mama Bear. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, no matter who the Pharaoh is, no matter how much the Pharaoh tweets, yeah. no matter what the Pharaoh does, we got a Mama Bear, we got a God, and don't you get nervous, don't you get give up, don't you get nervous, don't get nervous, because that's a great champion on the promised land. God is a champion, God is a champion, and you keep the faith. Le